Welcome to Idea to IPO. My name is Rob. I organize Idea to IPO. We've been holding events in Silicon Valley for many, many years. We launched officially on February 1st, 2010. At that time, we had no members and no events on our calendar. At this stage, we have over 700,000 members among all our meetup groups all around the world. We've organized, promoted, and produced over 4,400 events. By any standard, by any measure, we're the most active, most prolific startup event organization in the history of Silicon Valley, bar none. Thank you. Well, thank you for all your support. We hold venture capital panels, legal workshops, networking events, and more. We hold an event every day of the week. Check out our schedule at ideatoipo.com. Our mission is to promote entrepreneurship, support entrepreneurs, build community, and provide value in the Silicon Valley startup ecosystem. To that end, we provide content that is practical, actionable, and relevant, stuff you can actually use to succeed as entrepreneurs. And we believe in building community because Silicon Valley is a global aspirational ecosystem. It attracts people from all over the world who come here to do great things. Who here is not originally from Silicon Valley or the greater San Francisco Bay Area? Who here was born and raised in Silicon Valley or the greater San Francisco Bay Area? Wow, seven of you. Well, welcome, natives. Uh, so whether you were born and raised here or just arrived last night, it's important for us to provide multiple channels for you to meet people, build relationships, and grow your network. With regard to value, it's important that we provide value at each and every one of our events. Not just value for your money, which is important, though, because we know many entrepreneurs are struggling financially. So we make sure our events are free or affordable, and if you cannot afford the cover charge for whatever reason, come talk to me and we can work something out. And at most of our speaker events, we make sure that we provide a delicious buffet. Is that a delicious buffet? Oh, come on, is that a delicious buffet? More importantly though, at each and every one of our events, we want to make sure that we provide value for your time, which is your most valuable resource. Anyone here getting any younger, besides this young man <laughs> and our panel? So when you invest your valuable time to come to our events, we want to make sure that you maximize your ROI. We have many partners that help us do what we do. Law firms, venture capital firms, angel investor groups, incubators, accelerators, colleges, universities, and lots of other players in the Silicon Valley startup ecosystem. Tonight, we're grateful to the College of San Mateo for hosting us once again at this beautiful venue. Is this a beautiful venue? Yeah. Come on, is this a beautiful venue? Some of our other partners are here tonight. I would like to have them say a few words. Let's hear it for Ankit and Cordify. Applause. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Ayur, to IPO for having us. Hello, everybody. Panelists, my name is Ankit. I represent Cordify. We're a professional services org, and we take care of all your software development needs. So if you're an entrepreneur working on an idea and you're looking for a fractional CTO or a dev team to make your idea a reality, please find us. We have a booth right in the center. Again, we're Cordify, professional services, and software dev. Thank you. All right, next up, we have George from SVB. Applause. Uh, hello, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is George from Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, yeah, so last year around this time, we had a slight bump in the road. And <laughs> but uh, happy to report, best case scenario, we have a new parent company that came in for Citizens Bank, uh, allowed us to be back in market, doubling down on our efforts to work with the startup, econ uh, startup innovation economy. Uh, for, so for those of you who don't know, for Silicon Valley Bank, we make bank only founders in the uh, ideation all the way up to IPO and beyond. And so my role in particular is how do we, how do I help founders beyond banking? How do I connect the dots, uh, introduction to investors, and also have cool events like this as well. So thank you all. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to find us in the back. So thanks again, everyone. 
All right, next up we have Lolo from Metis. Applause. Good evening, y'all. How you doing? Good. Yeah, I'm excited for these panelists. We are happy to share this space with you. As Rob said, my name is Lolo Fisher from Metis Real Estate, and I'm here with my colleague Wallace Chain as well. We are here because we love being around innovators, dreamers, and big thinkers, and more specifically, to help you all find your real estate dreams and make those into a reality as well. So if you have any questions on buying, selling, investing, or just what's going on with the market right now, please come see us in the foyer after. We will also have a home buyer workshop coming up soon that I'd love to tell you about. Other than that, enjoy the event, and thank you, panelists. All right, next up, we have Alina from Primum Law Firm. Applause. Good evening. My name is Alina Fersava. I'm an attorney at Primum Law Group. Uh, we help startups at different stages of financing with corporate and business transactions, with venture capital, and with protection of intellectual property of the founders. We target international founders, as we know that your path to the U.S. market can be hard, but we welcome everyone, and I'm pretty sure you will have an exciting event with this panelists. Thank you. All right, next up we have a tool from CSPA. Applause. Hello, everyone. Good evening. <clears throat> uh, I am Atul from CSPA, um, California Software Professionals Association. Uh, our chairman, Henry, is also sitting here. Uh, uh, um, CSPA is happy to partner with the idea to IPO um, in helping and uh, sub to sub in supporting and uh, supporting idea to IPO and helping him organize events. I um, hope you are all are having a great time uh, help, uh, attending the event and networking with each other. Uh, 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 yeah. uh, see you all, uh, talk to you. Thank you everyone for your time. Uh, great meeting everyone. All right, next up we have Peter from Silicon Zombies. Applause. Hey everyone. So yeah, my name is Peter. I'm the producer of Silicon Zombies. Uh, here's a question. How many of you guys have heard of Silicon Zombies? Oh great. Most of you guys haven't. This is perfect. Um, we are a tech-based talk show. We have, our, we have events twice a month. Um, I call it a talk show because at this point I feel like calling us a podcast is doing us a disservice because we have a pretty large attendance in terms of our live events, and they're pretty fun. Um, if you guys want to know what our events are, just feel free to sign the QR code over by my uh, the, ba the banner. Events are pretty straightforward. We have a party, we have a show, we have a party. So we sandwich our events in between two part, well, in between one party, um, and we try to keep that you know pretty standard. But if you miss them, feel free to go watch our shows virtually. Um, our shows are pretty straightforward. We just have. We, are you guys familiar with the term edutainment? It's pretty new, it's kind of, it came from TikTok. <laughs> but it's basically learning something in a fun way. That's what we do. So if you guys want to learn more, I'm going to be up there. Find the tall Chinese guy. All right, here's the schedule for the rest of the evening. Our panel will hold a brilliant, compelling, dynamic, entertaining, and scintillating discussion, right? Just, just, just saying. Uh, at 8 o'clock, we'll open it up to questions from the audience. We'll wrap up the program at 8.30 p.m. Stick around. You can network, socialize, and connect. There will be an after party. Uh, more on that later. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it off to our distinguished moderator, me. <laughs> so let's find out who's in the room. Who's an early stage entrepreneur? What's the difference between a pizza and an early stage entrepreneur? A pizza can feed a family of four. <laughs> Who is a founder of a venture-backed startup? Oh. Who's the founder of a unicorn? Well, who's the founder of a potential unicorn? Well, we have confidence there. It's good. Who is a government employee? Who is an enterprise employee? Who's a student or an academic? Who's a media person or a journalist? Nice. Who's here for the delicious buffet? 
Well, thank you for coming. So panel, I have two questions, what's hot and what's not, and then I'm done. However, let's start with introductions. Why don't you introduce yourself, your background, what you invest in, and what your typical check size is. Alex. Thanks, Rob. My name's Alex McIsaac. I'm the solo GP at a fund called Northside Ventures. I was born in New York, but I, I'm based in Toronto. I'm currently living in San Mateo here. It's a $15 million fund. My checks are about 200 to 300K. I'm investing very early, true pre-seed. So two founders in a deck, point of ideation, company inception. Generalist fund with a founder thesis, really around experienced founders who have worked at scaled tech companies, repeat entrepreneurs, and are taking some sort of unique insight into their next venture as a competitive advantage. Excited to be here. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Rob, for having us. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Um, my name is Ashish. I'm a partner at a firm called Chameleon. My background is a mix of uh, started my, my career 18 years ago at a Yahoo. Uh, was an enge early engineer for Yahoo. Uh, built a couple of companies after that. Uh, they didn't scale well. Then came to the U.S. almost a decade plus ago. Uh, did a couple of other corporate gigs and then moved into early stage investing after running a cop dev group for a large public company. Um, um, my firm is Chameleon, early stage VC fund. We typically do one to $3 million check size. Multi-specialist, primarily invest in consumer, enterprise, and deep tech categories. Leader co-lead those rounds, also invest in uh, bigger scale rounds. Um, I think from our perspective, we invest uh, globally. Uh, we have an office over here in San Francisco. We also have an office in uh, Portugal. I think two-point of differentiation for us, we built our own in-house tech and quant engine called Mantis that tracks millions of companies globally and helps us understand what are the best companies that we should be speaking with at any given point in time. We have a seven-people tech team in-house, which differentiates us significantly from pretty much majority of the VC funds out there. Um, all of us are operators turned entrepreneurs turned investors, and we love to meet entrepreneurs who are building something which is disrupting big industries. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm Karen Roder davis I'm a managing partner at Entrada Ventures. Uh, we're a seed stage fund based both in Santa Barbara and in Silicon Valley. Uh, we invest in enterprise uh, and industrial technology, which means anywhere from you know, B2B software all the way through to deep tech. Uh, for my background specifically, uh, I started my Silicon Valley career as a, an attorney representing venture companies, as uh, venture, venture funds as well as startups and then moved to Google pre-IPO, where I helped to scale uh, a lot of their now billion dollar businesses um, and manage the internal uh, aspects of Google's IPO. Uh, I left to do a bunch of other things, uh, came back uh, to a startup uh, as the first business person into it that, lo and behold, was acquired by Google. So came back to the mothership. And after the integration, I managed a deep tech portfolio there uh, prior to joining Entrada. So uh, we tend to invest at the seed stage, as I said, about um, one to two million on average. Uh, we tend to like to lead the round, take a board seat, and all of us have been either founders or uh, executives at successful startups. Uh, so we really empathize with the founder position and uh, hope to really add value and partner with our founders uh, going forward. That's our philosophy. Thanks. Good evening. Uh, my name is Jim DeSanto. I am the managing partner of Modus Ventures. We're <clears throat> located in here in Silicon Valley, in Menlo Park, and Redwood City. And then we uh, just opened an office in Westwood, California. If you don't know where that is, it's uh, right next to the great college of UCLA. Um, nice place. If you haven't been there, you should go. And uh, let's see, my background. Uh, Prior to being in, founding uh, this venture capital firm um, about 10 years ago, uh, I was an entrepreneur and uh, three different companies I founded. Um, one went public uh, during the uh, dot bomb, I mean dot com uh, arena, and then the we got caught in the downdraft, unfortunately, of that, but um, you know worked out okay. And then another company that was uh, uh, also went into somehow got IPO. I, I'm not sure I wasn't there, but um, that did okay. And then I uh, 
was the founder uh, about uh, tw 15 years ago, of a co-founder of a company that uh, was acquired by the Chinese automotive industry, and that was quite a, quite a rocket ride. Um, amazing growth that happened in that industry, and I learned a ton. So uh, now I'm a little bit louder. So what do we invest in? Uh, we invest in seed stage companies and Series A companies. Our check size is uh, anywhere from 250000 to a million. Um, we typically reinvest if the companies are doing well. Uh, the areas we like to invest in, on the one hand, we, we invest in AI and AI-related stuff. And that tends to, as you know now, there's all these massive AI models that are running a lot of data center time, burning up a lot of fossil fuel, and throwing a lot of carbon into the air. So on the other hand, we invest in clean tech, right, to clean up all that carbon. And when it's all cleaned up, we go back and invest in the AI again, and then back to the clean tech and back to the AI. They can call that the circular economy, I think. So that's our, our thesis seems to be working pretty well. Happy to talk to anybody if you're interested in those areas. Thank you. How's it going, everyone? My name is Charles Wang. Uh, I'm a principal investor at Good AI Capital. Um, Good, at Good AI Capital, we invest in the verticals of healthcare, automation, and enterprise software. Uh, we're an early stage venture capital firm investing from C to Series V, uh, typically investing from 200,000 to up to um, 2 million um, per check. And uh, as for myself, oh, actually, um, we also invest, we have two focuses in, um, in our investments as well. Uh, one is we look for investments uh, with, uh, that, have a, that can align with our model of doing well by doing good. Um, and that sort of means basically beyond, uh, of course, like venture capital return for a fund, we look for opportunities where um, companies are, you know, creating sort of a positive externality for society. And beyond that, uh, we also have a, um, fun thesis of high conviction, high concentration. So um, we are very selective sort of with our investments and uh, the idea is that we can limit sort of our focus of portfolio companies and that enables us to essentially be more of a partner and value add to our portfolios and partners and founders. Um, as for myself, uh, I come from an engineer background and um, before, uh, before um, heading to venture capital, I was an engineer, software engineer. I worked at Palantir as a Ford deployed software engineer. Um, so I worked, uh, I was client facing and I essentially got to see the implementation of software and front lines in many different verticals. Um, so I was there for five years and then I moved over to venture capital and um, I focus on data and AI and enterprise investments. Um, yeah, it's myself. All right, today is March 28th, 2024. It seems like it was just New Year's Eve, wasn't it? In any case, it's almost the end of Q1, 2024. 2023 was an interesting year. So maybe you can briefly touch on how is 2023 on a micro, macro, or even on a personal level, and how's it been for Q1, and uh, what do you see happening the rest of 2024? And maybe touch on some hot niches or, or business models. Anyone? Karen. Sure. Uh, 2023 is pretty brutal all around. I don't know about you all, but <laughs> it was a rough go. I think statistically it was one of the worst fundraising seasons for venture capitalists, which then, you know, for new funds and, and repeat funds. And that put more pressure, I think, on, on entrepreneurs. There was a lot less capital out there. Uh, I think people slowed the pace of investing somewhat, except for certain sectors like AI that kind of you know, went a little bit uh, overhyped, in my opinion, even though we do invest in some AI, uh, we try to be particularly disciplined. Um, so I would say for us at the end of 2023, we started seeing an uptick in our opinion in deal quality. Um, and uh, we've made a, a several investments um, and a couple more in the queue in 2024. It feels like the fundraising uh, side is picking up a little bit, although we have yet to hear again about, you know, where things are closing. Um, but uh, I think everyone seems to be fairly optimistic this year, despite a lot of the uncertainties uh, in the macro, 
uh, market. Um, I think everyone seems to be holding an optimistic bent as opposed to 2023, where people seem to be more embracing and hunkering down, which affected current companies' also ability to sell. Uh, so from the enterprise software side, I don't know any companies that actually hit their sales targets. They were all under, as company, their customers hunker down with budgets, um, and I think have continued to be cautious. So the, there's reasons to be excited, uh, but I think um, somewhat cautiously excited. <laughs> Maybe I'll add here. Um, the way I look at 2023 was kind of early stage and growth stage. Growth stage was really dead. Uh, really no growth rounds happening. At the early stage, it was really polarized. We saw very kind of low activity for any kind of mid-level or kind of less experienced founder, but the experienced founders had kind of a lot of venture capital firms competing to do those rounds because not many other deals were getting done. So we really didn't see, or at least I didn't see a pricing kind of discount uh, for the deals that got done because they were typically kind of the cream of the crop type of deals and it was competitive. What I'm seeing in 2024, that's kind of interesting, particularly in the last month, is a ton of activity. It really feels like in the last three weeks, like things are back. I don't know if that's a function of early stage being here and you know YC is kind of you know, pre-demo day, but it feels like every fund that I'm talking to in the last month has really increased their activity level. So it'll be really interesting to see how the Q1 numbers play out when everyone starts reporting on them in Q2. Um, I think uh, I'll take a little bit different stance on it. Um, I think if you take a step back, right, coming out of COVID, uh, we're still in COVID, by the way. I had COVID last month. I think everything is tied to the, inter the interest rates, right, from that perspective. So I think as the interest rates have gone up, everything that is dependent on that if you can make 5% in public markets, why would you invest your capital anywhere else? So for all the investors, money went into money market funds. And if you go look at the, how the money market funds, there is still around, I think, significant amount of capital that's sitting in public markets on the sideline, even though the stock market is already at all times high or kind of trending towards that. And because of that, there is a, uh, and if, you're, if you can make that much amount of money just by being in treasuries, why would you kind of like take more risk? And that's why it had a huge impact on everything else going on. Housing market was impacted. I'm sure all of you have read enough about it. I think the commercial office market, because nobody wanted to go back to work, the hybrid work kind of like scenario that coming back. And, and I mean, San Francisco have historic like 40% uh, office market empty, which is crazy. Um, I think things that are kind of like not going well, even in 2024, the commercial office market and the commercial is kind of like going to go through a lot of things. I think I would just suggest kind of like you know, go take a look at it. A lot of uh, there is going to be a lot of significant amount of pain this year and next year, um, depending on how these things actually work. Um, I think coming back to uh, private equity, there is a lot of private equity capital have been raised. There is a significant amount of private equity dry powder. Dry powder in this case is the amount of money that these uh, private equity funds have raised, and that's why I think. There was a lack of IPO exit, and the way the venture capital industry work, limited partners who actually we raise money from didn't have enough money go back to them. So that's why we couldn't raise money enough money, uh, or VCs couldn't raise enough money from LPs, and that's why there is, they've become a little bit more disciplined around how much money they are deploying in into into startups because it's difficult for us to raise money as such. So it's kind of like a whole cycle. IPO window is going to open up a little bit more because with Reddit going public, there are a few other companies that are align and everybody's watching, hopefully by, from what I've been hearing from other bankers, it seems like Q1 2025, Q2 2025 is going to be when floodgates are going to hopefully open up. There is a lot of M&A activity that's still happening because all these, uh, all these software companies that are kind of have lower multiples, private equity companies are going in and buying them. So there is a lot of M&A activity that you have seen last year and this year overall. Uh, on the venture capital side, the amount of deal activity has picked up significantly as such. 2023, we had two really brutal, ugly wars, massive inflation, and hilarious politics. What's not to like? So the macro environment in 2023 and now in 2024, my opinion, is shaky. Uh, you know, I don't like it. Um, I've been doing this for 30 years as an entrepreneur and now as a VC, and I just think the... Um, you know, the global scale macro situation is very risky. 
I see a lot of risk and less reward. Here's, here's an interesting factor. Warren Buffett is sitting on $158 billion in cash. He's not writing checks. And that's a guy who does not like risk, and he's pretty much right all the time. So I'm going to wait till Warren starts investing, then I'm going to start. <laughs> Um, yeah, maybe I can speak uh, a little bit more to, I guess, yeah, I, I share a lot of sort of the sentiments regarding the macro um, and sort of things we've seen on the valuation side of the startups. Um, uh, sort of following on on the AI point, yeah, it seemed like AI was pretty much the sector that was getting the most love um, this past year. Um, and we saw that in especially the early stage valuations um, that were being driven up essentially as being the major focus. Um, so I agree that as investors, um, something at least um, I and our firm, we try to stand by is being focused in our due diligence process and being willing to stick with our guts in terms of our termination of evaluation of a startup versus a lot of sort of the, I guess, FOMO money that's been chasing around, um, you know, sort of big names, big brands, big talent. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, there's also a compromise where, you know, Big names, big companies with talent, with money. You know, if they are, if they do have the promise. You know, you'd have to pay up for that. So there's also the counter side to that as well. Um, I think more from the technical side standpoint. Last year, we also saw a lot of sort of shifting, a shifting in the landscape of technology, especially in the AI side. It seemed like you know, as even as a person who spends my full time like looking at the space, it's hard to keep up with all the news that was coming out um, from AI technology. And uh, a lot of sort of, I mean, for example, if you take a look at the YC startups from um, the last summer's batch to, to this winter's, for example, uh, you'll see a, a sort of a significant, um, well, not significant, but you'll see a, a sort of shift in the themes of startups that are co coming to crop up. And, you know, there was a huge focus and top topic focus uh, last year around vector databases, prompt engineering, things like that. But with a lot of sort of, um, you know, updates and releases from large language model companies, a lot of uh, companies have sort of had to re, uh, reorient and shift their focus um, as a startup, and as a result, you're seeing different sorts of focus in this current batch too, and um, and just generally in the startup landscape. So, um, I feel like for me, it's, it's it seems like one of those sectors where uh, it, it's sort of an area where you know first to market doesn't necessarily mean that you have the right plan for a business model or technology moving forward. So you just have to keep on your toes and um, you know be willing to adapt to change. You know, climate tech is a hot topic, no pun intended, but it seems like there's a climate tech conference event uh, every every week, uh, which is kind of ironic because, I mean, it's an industry that supposedly, well, it's a niche where you're trying to save the planet, but you're creating more degradation by holding these events. All of our events went online during the pandemic, and we actually did quite well. Um, we were able to get panelists from all over the world. We got several hundred people on each event, uh, watching virtually. And the question that always came up was, can you still build trust, do deals, and fund companies without meeting face-to-face? -face? And it was concluded universally that yes, it could be done. And then all of a sudden now everyone's flying all over the place. I ask people, do you want to be on the panel? And they have to tell me, no, I'm in Zurich, I'm in Tokyo, I'm in Singapore. I mean, all they have to do is say no. For some reason, they got to tell me where they're going. But, in any case, um, can you still do business virtually? And if not, why not? Or do you just like flying first class? I think the answer is yes, you can do deals virtually, but people just by our nature like interacting with other people. And so the preference, if possible, is to meet face to face. I think during the pandemic, I did 30 deals in 30 months. It was super active. But when I could travel, I still want to go meet those founders. There's nothing like sharing a meal or a drink and having a longer form conversation that's not rushed and packed into like a 25 minute Zoom call. You can read body language, you can read chemistry between founders a little bit better. Doesn't mean you can't do it all remote. I think it's just a better experience and it's an opportunity to build a better relationship between the investor and the founder. So I still try and meet my founders uh, prior to investing as much as possible. Um, I think for us, um, it's kind of like a 
two things. One is, from the founder perspective, it's more efficient because then you can speak to a lot more investors. And I think from the investor perspective also, you can meet with a lot more companies on Zoom because in terms of efficiency, because it saves on a lot of traffic. If, I think if you look at, I was looking at something, <clears throat> traffic patterns are actually back and about pre-pandemic in pretty much all the major 10 metros across the US, um, which is kind of surprising. Um, at the same time, I think meeting in person, I think based on what Alex is saying, it's a, uh, that's also kind of like it goes in. So I think, but that becomes more of a, as you look at what are the, what are the best companies you want to spend more time with, I think that's where the in-person element comes in. So I think it becomes more of a hybrid situation that at least we, we, we follow. I would just add to that, the way I've kind of processed, so I'm a solo GP, I have to be super efficient with my time. My kind of internal policy with myself is all first meetings are Zoom, second meetings can be in person if possible. Uh, social media seems to be in the news, in the news a lot lately. Um, your thoughts on it? Is it a problem or is it a problem of regulation or people addicted? Is it bad for kids? I think that it has contributed to the polarization of our society in a way that is largely unproductive um, and in some cases very harmful. I think it's been awful for our children. I think um, I, Jonathan Haidt just came out with a book uh, recently that um, where he says that we have um, overprotected people, our children in the real world, and underprotected them online, uh, and I subscribe to that. Um, and the question is, uh, you know, how, I, I think it's a little late, though, in terms of regulation. Uh, it's not over, but I think um, it needs to be, like any regulation, thoughtfully done, uh, and we, uh, given, as uh, Jim said, the dysfunction in our current <laughs> government, that thoughtfully done is going to be incredibly challenging. Uh, I think they're kind of almost starting over with AI and trying to shift focus there and hopefully incorporate some of the lessons learned, uh, you know, more prospectively. I'll stop there. <laughs> What are your thoughts on ESG, environmental, social, governance, investing? And at the same time, what are your thoughts on DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion? And the Me Too movement, I mean, it's 2024. Uh, these ideas have been around for a while, but what are your thoughts on 2024 and how these are going to play out? I, I guess... Um on this topic, I think for, I, I think basically it's, yeah, it's, it's definitely, it's, it's definitely, uh, if you're on Twitter, um, you'll see posts by certain prominent people and it's a hard topic to avoid now online. Um, I think at the end of the day, um, if we're talking about the world of startups, uh, um, Founders, entrepreneurs, they are, you know, focused on a mission and um, they are looking basically, I mean, they're looking, you know, indiscriminately for like people who can provide them, you know, offer their talent, um, you know, to further the mission. And I think that comes from, you know, all walks of life, uh, every corner globally. Um, and, uh, in terms of the process for that, there's been a lot of debate and evolution of the topic. Uh, I think um, it's it's definitely something that people are trying to work to find the balance of in terms of doing it and then doing it too far. Um, but I think as a founder in a startup, you just have to be critical and focus on what is the outcome you're trying to achieve and who are the folks on your team that are going to take you there, basically. Um, yeah, but. Definitely a lot of work to still be done and debate in that topic, I guess. I'll focus on the E part of ESG. Um, earlier in my career, I had a clean tech startup in the energy storage space. This was 2012. We founded it. We sold it to private equity in 2018. Frankly, it felt like we were, we saw the problem in 2012. 
that the environment was kind of headed this direction. We're 12 years later now, and it feels like people have finally kind of caught on in the last couple of years as people's houses burn down and fires become more critical. Um, you know, at the at our startup, we we still had a we had a successful exit. I'd call it kind of like a double or a triple. It wasn't a unicorn or anything like that, but but it was a great exit. Everybody made money, uh, but it did feel like we were ahead of the curve. And I think right now what we're seeing is a lot of investment going into the category. People used to avoid investing in hardware, and I think there's a lot more funds taking a long-term view investing in hardware that solves uh, clean tech related problems. And I think that's gonna be exciting. I still think it will cost twice as much and take twice as long, but I think it's only gonna get worse every year. And so pe people will have the patience to see out the solutions. So that's something I'm super excited for. Um, and given just my operational background, we'll continue to invest in that space. I would just say, I think uh, whatever labels you put on these things, the problems are there and the opportunities are there. And it is, I'm looking for, as, a, as an investor, opportunities that are differentiated, unique perspectives where you can capitalize on a market and making sure that those teams are built in a way where they can be successful. And that means looking across the spectrum of all markets, uh, different business models that are creative, and having uh, a diverse set of views in the company to avoid groupthink, to have a more formidable and successful culture, and to increase shareholder value. Because studies have shown that more diverse teams, when managed well, uh, actually deliver better returns than teams that are more monolithic. Uh, I do believe uh, that everyone, that the companies benefit when they are mission driven, whatever that mission may be, and you're aligned. And so there's space for it all. I think putting labels on it where people then can pick apart the label instead of focusing on the overarching goal and solving a big important problem for people is where we should be focusing. I think uh, I'll just share one more thing from our perspective. I think we look at, from our fund perspective, high volume outbound deal flow. And we use a lot of data. And because of that, we have been labeled, we've been able to look at 25 to 50x higher deal flow uh, in any given year as compared to any other VC fund. So because of that, our portfolio kind of like reflects that. We have 70 plus percent plus ESG companies in our portfolio. 40% of our portfolio is women founders. So from that perspective, I think, uh, it's, it's, it's not the question of, um, we don't have any mandates, by the way, uh, that we have to invest in those companies, but just because those are good companies to invest in from our perspective. So, it's, so the, the startups are out there, it's the job of the VC to kind of go out and find them uh, as much as you can. Jim, anything to add? I already lost track of what the question is, sir. That's okay. <laughs> well, 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 you tell me what I'm supposed to answer. Well, so what global, macro, uh, global macro, geopolitical factors affect your investment outlook? I mean, there's a lot going on in the world. It's <clears throat> election year. Uh, there's a yeah, lot well, of stuff going on overseas. I just got done bashing 2023. Let me get started on 2024 here. So global outlook in 2024. I'm normally an optimist, but I'm sorry, tonight I'm not. <laughs> You should have some bourbon or something here. Cheer me up a little. Sorry. I know you like water. <clears throat> uh, I, I think that, you know, the wars continue. The crazy politics continue and, and seem to be getting, I don't know, worse. I, I used, you know, uh, years ago when I, was, when I was a U.S. Navy guy, I, I thought we, you know, we'd conquered all the bad bad people in the world and that the world was going to be democratic and everything. And now it turns out that that's not the case. And um, so for the first time in my life, I'm a little worried about that, um, you know, which way the world is going to go uh, on a political stage, either freedom and democracy versus the opposite. You know what the opposite is, right? You don't have to give examples. And uh, so that 
you know, that clash right there, that, that struggle for, for power at the, at the, uh, on the world stage, I don't think is good for investing markets. It's not stable. Um, what, uh, you know, what, what, what makes economies work well and what makes investments work well is a stable uh, political environment around the world. Um, and I just don't see it right now. I hope that we will return to that. The, the other concern I have is the debt cycle. So if anybody's interested in macroeconomics, I'm not an economist, by the way, just a closet one. I watch YouTube videos at night on this stuff and read about it. Uh, but the debt cycle, uh, you know, every, I think the, the idea is every 60 to 70 years, right, we have a big correction, right? It's, it's what's called a, uh, a deleveraging. In between those periods of time, we have these cycles, right, where the world loads up on debt a little bit too much, then we go into a recession, but the recession is solved by politicians flooding the market with cash or uh, lowering interest rates, doing the same thing, whatever they're doing, stimulating the economy, a bunch of uh, programs to, you know, get the jobs running again and everything, and then you kind of build up, people get happy, the economy looks good, so more borrowing occurs, more, more loans and more debt, and then there's another little recession. And that just keeps going on until you just get so leveraged, both the government and business and consumers get so leveraged that you have a crash. And the last time that occurred was? Well, if you said 2008, you'd be right. And then you have a big deleveraging of the economy where a whole kind, you know, banks go under, but the government has to step in and forgive, you know, put loans aside and pay off loans and give insurance companies like AIG all their bonuses, even though they screwed up big time, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, um, I'm actually concerned that that's going to happen a lot sooner in the next two decades, right? Another big deleveraging because there's just way too much debt, uh, in my opinion. It's just getting worse. So uh, on a macro scale over the next couple of decades, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not bullish. I'm not optimist. Uh, this year, I think 2024 is going to be another tough year. Uh, that's going to turn around. It always does. Um, it is election year, by the way. So uh, get ready for a, a pump up in the stock market, um, you know, to try to get more votes. And that might happen. So I think we, we may be into a good scenario by the end of the year. And that will hopefully be a growth period for the U.S. and, and the world economy. Um, but again, the debt overhang is, is, what, is what's going to drive things in the long term. What practical advice do you have to give to entrepreneurs out there for getting funded in this current environment, whether they're in, well, who's in AI? Who's in health tech? Who's in climate tech? Uh, who's in ed tech? Robotics, quantum computing, in any case. What practical advice do you have for them if they want to get funded by you? I'll just kind of dovetail, dovetail off Jim's answer around kind of macro and how the changing macro climate influences founders and their decision on what to build and how to raise capital. <clears throat> One of the biggest shifts we saw when interest rates went up at kind of like skyrocket paces, uh, skyrocket pace was um, this massive shift from uh, growth at all costs and burn for top line revenue to become profitable essentially overnight. This was at the beginning of, you know, 20, this is 2022 really, but it's carried on. I think as a result, companies that did that will be heavily rewarded and companies that didn't, maybe they raised a bridge round, I think are going to die. And so we're going to see a lot of kind of that play out, I think in the first six months of this year. But if you're a founder today, I think it's really important to know that and understand that that shift happened and factor that into your decision on what business you want to build today. Can that business be efficient? Can you theoretically reach profitability off the back of raising a seed round? That's really never been said before because it's expected that you're going to burn cash for a number of rounds. But 
that's really important today. I think investors more than ever are looking at the business model, or I'll say the vision for the business model that founders have. Can this be a high gross margin business model? It doesn't have to be SaaS or B2B SaaS, but can this thing make enough gross margin to cover your fixed costs? Can you use AI to build a 10 person, uh, 50 million, 100 million ARR company? Can you get more efficient on your hiring and have lower burn? Those types of things are really important to consider when you're deciding what business to build and are definitely something that early stage investors are, are looking at today. Uh, I guess I would, I would come at it from a, a different, slightly different perspective, which is if I'm looking at a pitch, what am I looking for? Um, I think I am looking for first the team, first and foremost. Uh, how do they work together? What have they done before? How do I know that they can actually do what they say they're going to do? Uh, how do they, uh, are they self-aware? Uh, all of these other you know, characteristics, but it starts with team because a team can be resilient and manage the highs and the lows uh, and the invariable problems that will occur in a business model or an operating plan or a tech that doesn't work or something like that. Um, then I'm looking for a large market opportunity. Um, I think the biggest mistake that founders make is they don't understand venture math. And what I mean by that is, you know, we run a fund at the seed stage. We are looking, like, for every company that we invest in, we're looking for an 100x return on our investment. And so if you're looking at, if you're presenting me with a business plan and I do quick math to figure out what's, what, what are they going to need to go forward in the next round or even can they get to profitability, maybe, you know, when this goes out, what does this revenue and margin look like? And does this give me my 100x? And it's just, there's some phenomenal businesses out there that just aren't venture businesses. It doesn't mean you shouldn't do them. It means that they're probably not venture investable. But understanding that venture math is really important and the market opportunity. And then, of course, what, why, what you're trying to do, what's the differentiation, what is the compelling differentiation that's going to win, not the 85 companies out there that are attacking the same market. And you can't tell me why you're going to beat them all or you're going to be doing nothing because that's also a wonderful competitor that you have to deal with sometimes. So uh, that's what I look for when uh, I'm talking to entrepreneurs and then they really understand how much money they're taking in and what those milestones are going to be, whether that is showing profitability or cash flow break even, or when I get to this stage, this is what I'm gonna promise that this looks like and that will help me grow the pie and increase the valuation for the next investor that comes in and continue to show that I can build this company to a successful exit. That's really, if you can, if you can convince me of that, that's, that's it. It's that easy. <laughs> but there's a lot there, but that's really what I'm looking for. And that's why I think collectively we invest in so few businesses. It's very hard. It's very hard to do. I think the only thing I would add in addition to this is I think as a founder, I think you should think about two more things. One is um, try to understand the market in which you are fundraising because a lot of people miss that because they go by heuristics based on what they have read on the internet. But if you do more research, like in your category, what are the last 10 companies that have been funded and what is their kind of, how much money they have raised from who? And I think that information will help you understand because today uh, companies are pitching to raise, let's say, 5 million at 25 post or a seed round, seed round when you don't have a product, very hard to raise money. But, uh, because there are companies out there that have between half a million to 2 million of revenue that are trying to raise a sub 20 million post money valuation. So you have to understand what the market is and when you are going in. So that's why the timing of fundraising matters quite a bit. So, and, and you also have to understand, right? I mean, like, for example, if you try to go and fundraise in summer, people are out of office. So you're not going to get quite a bit of uh, uh, response rate. At the same time, there is no business that happens between November and December, right? So you have to understand some of these things of like how the, the timing of when you're going to the market is going to impact your fundraising and be doing more research would be helpful for you. Also understand 
because majority of these uh, firms also can like talk about publicly these days what they are investing in, what their typical check size is like. So having that information would help you narrow down the, the VCs and the venture capital funds that you need to talk to. Like we have all of these information listed on our website. So if you just go there and spend five minutes, you know exactly what we are investing in and why. Just piggybacking on that, and then I will cede the floor. But I think also understanding where what the process is and where you are in it. So this is a sale. You are trying to sell, you know, your your company, your idea to someone and have them invest. You're trying to make the sale. What does that sales cycle look like? What does that process look like? Where are you in it? A lot of folks think that they got a yes or they're close to getting approval or a term sheet when depending on how the fund works, they may have a lot more stakeholders to go through and a lot more steps. And so it's very, it's a, a very reasonable question to ask what's the next step? Where are we in the process? What does your approval process look like? Um, so you can manage all of the different folks that you're talking to and come to a point where you have a convergence and then hopefully choices to make. But not knowing where you are, you, you, you can't make that market happen. So understanding that sales process is important. We have a few minutes left before we go to audience Q&A. Would you like to make a prediction about something that's going to happen in the next year or so? And I asked this question in February 1st, 2024, and the panel all said the San Francisco 49ers were going to win the Super Bowl. And in 2016, someone said that Hillary Clinton would be the next president of the United States. And that's all on YouTube, and you can look it up. So here's your chance to live on forever on YouTube, making a prediction. Sports, politics, interest rates, Silicon Valley, housing, whatever. It's optional. And then let the audience know how you can be contacted, if you want to be contacted. You can give out your cell number, your home address, however you want to be contacted. <laughs> Uh, Alex. All right. Prediction for this year. I think the IPO market is going to come back super hot in the back, back half of the year, September-ish time frame. Um, if you want to reach me, uh, you can hit me up on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm a super LinkedIn user. I respond to all my messages. That's the best place to find me. Um, I think for me, um, the prediction would be commercial office space market is going to see a lot of pain coming in this year and next year. Uh, I think contact me at, you can reach me at uh, a at chameleon.vc. Just email me. I think that's the best way to reach me. I think Caitlin Clark's going to pull it off for Iowa. I'll just say it. I'll throw it out there before she hits the uh, WNBA. Uh, and you can reach me on LinkedIn. Uh, that's, that's the best way. Thanks. I'm getting lost again. Uh, 2024, um, I agree with this uh, commercial real estate. That is just a uh, disaster waiting to happen. Here's what else is happening. Generative AI. There's cracks in the armor. Right? Just had $2 billion blow-ups. Inflection, one point some billion dollars of assets sold for $675 million in a um, fire sale to Microsoft. And man, the, uh, the soap opera was just amazing around that. All founders doing all these things to each other and leaving. It was great. More entertainment is always good. Uh, and then what was uh, yesterday? Oh, stable diffusion, aka now unstable diffusion, is uh, coming apart. Um, why is this happening? How is it that tens of billions, almost 100 billion, right, maybe more than that, have been thrown into all these AI companies in the past two hours and 37, I mean, the past 24 months, and now they're blown up? I mean, how do you burn through a billion dollars in two years? Does anyone know that? I'll tell you how. You give it to Amazon, you give it to Microsoft, you give it to Google. These companies are burning through 
anywhere from five to 10, up to $100 million a month on model training in the cloud, right? So I'm starting carbon remo removal companies in the, in the background to get, get all that carbon out of the air. Uh, so, so that's not sustainable. There's no ROI on that. No one's gonna pay you for that poem or beautiful picture that you dreamed up on AI, or even for doing some customer service, you know, like Delta does, where you tell someone to buy a ticket and then said, eh, I faked you out, you really shouldn't have bought that ticket. Um, there's just no ROI there for that kind of money. That's why companies like Oracle just say, you know what, let these guys do that and we'll just pay them a little bit of money to have their data and their models and they can go spend 100 million trying to make it. That's great, the investors are paying for that. That's not gonna last very long, right? So that's one of my predictions for 2024. You're gonna see a lot more AI crashes, big ones, billion dollars, many of them. Because there's just nothing out there that's sustainable. Maybe open AI, maybe Anthropic, and maybe one or two more in the startup world. And then you got all the big guys. And we'll, we'll see what happens there. But these are almost all gonna be acquired. Maybe one will be a long-standing real company. It's just not, I just don't see it. I don't think it's possible. So that's my prediction on AI, and then I'll, I'll shut up. I see your fingers. Charles. <laughs> um, yeah, shoot, Jim, Jim sort of stole my, um, or just preempted me on the, the AI um, comment there. But yeah, I, I guess I'll just sort of add to that and that like um, coming one to two years, yeah, probably should expect to see a lot of um, closures or just um, murders, acquisitions of these AI um, businesses uh, in, in the AI industry in general, basically. Um, there's a lot of money that's being invested in this space and you see a lot of similar, a lot of companies working on the similar, similar sorts of problems, uh, maybe for different verticals or maybe for similar verticals. So um, some of these, a lot of these can have multiple winners. Um, so we'll probably see a lot of um, unfortunate uh, closures coming up. Uh, I guess a sports prediction, maybe next year. Uh, I went to Michigan, they won this year. Uh, go Blue. And then uh, uh, 49ers. Good man. <laughs> uh, 49ers, they couldn't close the deal. But who knows, maybe next year we see them both in the finals and they close it. But that's my hope. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, let's give it up for our panel. So now it's time for audience participation. You can walk up to the microphone, ask away. This is not a pitch event, so do not deliver a pitch or a thinly disguised pitch. If you deliver a pitch or a thinly disguised pitch, you will have to deal with Joe, our bouncer. <laughs> First question. Hey guys, thanks so much for all the thoughts. I'm kind of wondering, not on the founding team, but in the early stage hires, kind of more in the later growth phases of startup and VC, how important is having an ex internal team versus an external team? And how do you feel about contracting and outsourcing work versus building it internally to a company? I think it depends on uh, what part of your company is core to your business. And are you contracting that out or not? Like for example, there is a generative AI company where AI is being built by someone else. So then it becomes a question is then, then why, why wouldn't they just build that company? What is your core? So think on identifying what are core to your business that you are doing yourself. Having somebody else that's kind of like, you know, external to help you in some capacity can work, but understanding that would be critical for any investor. I'll focus on one aspect of that question. There's a lot of aspects, but around sales, Founder-led sales, when you're pre-product market fit, I think are critical. Do not outsource sales if you're starting your company on day, day you know, scaling zero to one. That is just so important for the founder to be in, interacting with customers and receiving feedback to speed up the iteration on product and guiding the, the direction of the company. If there's one thing you cannot outsource, it's what that man just said. You cannot outsource product market fit. Ever. In fact, what I found out the hard way is you can't even hire that onto your team. If you're the founders, you have to live that product, breathe that product, live it, walk in your customer's shoes, 
it's, it's your responsibility. That can never ever be, not only can it be outsourced, you can't even hand it off to somebody on your team. It's you. If you're the founder of the company, it's your product vision, and that product, you better have a customer for that product. You better know exactly what that customer wants. You better make sure your product fits that need and that that customer loves it and is willing to pay for it. And you just look at all the most successful companies in this Silicon Valley. They all did that. You, ha you, can't, you, you have to do that. So don't ever outsource the product, uh, the product ma marketing or the product management or the, or, and, and that product customer interaction. Just can't, can't outsource that. Uh, so I did see Caitlin Clark play at, she was playing against Michigan. I was watching him at, at Michigan a couple of years ago, and I've never seen a basketball player play like that. So I think the Warriors maybe should consider her on there to get them over the hurdle here at some point. Uh, but my question is, you talk about check sizes and 200,000 to a million, 1 million to 3 million. Uh, but at that pre-seed, so I was talking to someone at First Round Capital, you know, the, the difference between a pre-seed and seed, and what their definition was of that. But at the seed level, uh, you know, irrespective of where the cash is coming in at the numbers, it's going to be a, obviously a function of valuation, the discussions back and forth, founders going to push it up. But where's your average percentage of ownership lie at that seed uh, pre-seed or seed level or pre-seed pre level? Where, where do you sit in terms of on the cap table? on a percentage basis, because that's important for founders to know what their dilution is. Yeah, I mean, we like to target uh, anywhere between 10 to 20 percent. Um, I think 10 percent is usually 10 to 15 is where we usually wind up. Um, and uh, that's, that's roughly how, what it makes sense for us. But every fund is different based on their portfolio construction and uh, how they're thinking about things. If you're interested in kind of average round dilution, like for the entire round, Carta just came out with some interesting data this week, I think it was, that basically says average dilution for pre-seed rounds about 20.5% still. Uh, at the seed, it's also 20%. Uh, at the A, it, it's kind of, I think it's the A, it's dropping down to like 15. And then at the Bs and Cs, it's about closer to 10%. Thank you for your time and input. Bert Wank with Infineril at the nexus of AI and clean tech. Karen, you mentioned teams. Uh, to all of you that applied AI to successful startups, what's your experience level between teams that just happen to be all co-located and now teams that are remote? Since I can't hire data scientists away from Netflix for a million bucks, it's not going to work. No, that's just a stand. But you're getting near it. <laughs> I think, um, it, you know, if you, first of all, get the company stable and, and you have that product market fit, say that again, and you are figured out how the customer is going to buy and the business model and you're actually starting to get traction and you're experiencing repeatable sales, then you can start to outsource some of this stuff, right? You can outsource some of the sales to, you know, maybe telemarketing somewhere remote that's a lot less expensive. Uh, that's more really lead generation, let's say. You could, you know, if the, you, you really have the product defined and working and now you're just trying to scale up the product in terms of features and capabilities, then you can start to outsource that software development or now what's pretty popular is chip design. We've done that. One of our companies, after we got two and a half years under our belts and had a working chip, we were able to do the next version of Silicon, mostly in India, for a lot less money. And those are advantages. Those are actually advantages, but don't try to outsource early on. You're talking about a, a startup. You know, you really have to figure it out yourselves first. Get it scaled. Get it somewhat scaling. Get a repeatable business going. Then you can start looking at outsourcing some things. Yeah, I would just add that in terms of um, less about outsourcing, but in terms of uh, distributed teams versus centralized teams. Uh, I, it really comes down to communication and it comes down to the composition of the teams. And so, for example, if you are hiring a lot of junior people 
with less experience that need more oversight and need to learn, they can be exceptionally effective, but it means that you need to train them, you need to really communicate, and if they are remote, they really miss that sort of in the moment, read the room, offhanded comment after a meeting, walk down the hallway and explain why you did something, social aspects of team building and culture that, and context that enable them to be way more effective than if they're remote. Uh, somebody who is more experienced and can has by its nature an independent job may work better in a remote setting. Um, either way, whenever you get together now, I think there's much more impetus and um, desire on behalf of all the teams to make that time together more fruitful and more productive in person as opposed to, well, we could have been on Zoom. So however you're figuring out your dynamics and staffing, um, it, it does require excessively more communication and more thought, forethought around in, in person. Whoever gets here first. <laughs> Ladies first. <laughs> Um, I'm going a little old school with this question. It's been a little while, I know, but wondering how you guys feel about investing in Web3 or blockchain. I investing in what? Web3 or blockchain? Web3. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, that was an answer. <laughs> Got uh, two questions. First one is um, people that do more seed rounds. So, uh, like for people that do uh, more consumer focused products, what are the standard like numbers of users that you think um, is where it gets appealing for you guys to invest? I'll take a crack. I'd say it depends. I'll give you an answer. It depends. The depends on the business, it depends on the type of consumer, it depends on the users. I remember I was on this one pitch, it was a gen AI company back in 2011 before uh, ChatGPT kind of dropped. Over, they, they were going viral, over a 30 minute call, they showed us the users before and after the call and they added 130,000 users in 30 minutes. That caught our attention. Now that's rare, that rarely ever happens, um, but that's not gonna happen every time. We did end up investing, they raised their Series A, the company's doing well. Um, but I'd say, depending on where the business is in their cycle, it's enough uh, users or traction for that investor to gain conviction in the business, in the model, in understanding that customer feedback. You know, when I do a B2B SaaS company, um, invest in B2B SaaS company, it's usually like sub 10 customers. What do those first 10 customers love? Um, what you know, how many, what percentage of that 10 love it? If it's more like a D to C company, it's, it's looking at, it's enough data to look at the unit economics around things like cohort analysis, uh, repeat purchase rates, payback, like CAC and payback on AOV. Like it's, it's however much data it takes to see those numbers or some semblance of those numbers to make a, a decision. Thank you so much. Very um, insightful. Um, we heard a lot of concerns about commercial real estate and um, AI, and rightly so. But on a positive note, what are the top three industry trends that you're most excited about? And within those industry trends, what kind of startups are you most looking forward to invest in? All right, I'll jump on that one. <clears throat> Actually, <laughs> I am, most int I am most bullish about AI. Um, there's many, many AIs, okay? So the, the AI that I like a lot is what we call applied AI, right? Where you're applying it to a real business problem. A couple examples would be, okay, how about factory, factory line inspection? Okay, moving stuff down a factory line. Let's say it's batteries. Let's say it's, I don't know, um, air conditioners, whatever it is, uh, automotive parts, have a camera, have multiple cameras, have an AI neural network behind that, looking, taking pictures and looking for defects. Okay, there's one example. How about robots in factory floor automation? How about robots in warehouses, right? You know, robots in warehouses do a lot today. Amazon's investing a lot of them and a lot of that, but still the amount of labor capital in, 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 for hu in human um, numbers 
is, is far in excess of robots. Why is that? And how come we don't have robotic autonomous cars racing around, all of, driving people all over the place today? How come we don't have robots cleaning houses? I mean, okay, you've got Roomba, that'll maybe sweep your floor a little bit, but where's the robot that comes in the kitchen and cleans up the dishes in the sink and puts them in the dishwasher and turns on the dishwasher? Where's that robot? So those things are all part of the future, but that's what I mean by practical AI. It's, it's not so much that we don't have the mechanics to do these things, you know, the, the mechatronics and so, and so forth. We, we don't have the AI to do that. We don't have enough perception in our AI systems to do those kinds of tasks. We don't have enough AI intelligence to make decisions, right, to do these jobs properly. And so I see a big future in that, a really big future. That's the kind of thing that gets me excited. I think uh, <clears throat> robotics is going to see a lot of companies kind of coming out in the next couple of years because uh, with the recent kind of like advancement in many, many fields coming together, uh, specifically I think what you saw at NVIDIA coming up with kind of like a multimodal uh, basic LLM from, for specifically for robots, uh, I think the cost of building robotics is going to come down significantly because you don't need as much data. Um, so, we, so we are very excited about that. I've seen a bunch of companies in that category. I think uh, gaming is kind of, again, going through a lot of uh, very interesting ideas. Uh, GDC just happened a couple of weeks ago in SF. Uh, saw multiple companies that are doing extremely unique concepts around creating uh, kind of like personas that are pers using AI from that perspective. I think healthcare is pretty big because it's a significant part that touches all of our lives in different ways. There are a lot of cost savings that can be done in different ways because uh, applying AI for process optimization, for cost reduction, uh, I think those things are significantly top of mind for us. I think one, one area I'm getting really excited about is autonomous agents um, and kind of a shift in business model from B2B SaaS or, or even B2B SaaS or B2C SaaS to um, selling a service or selling work. And so kind of the concept of a digital twin and having an autonomous agent perform work and selling that work um, is really interesting. And I'm seeing that being applied uh, both kind of horizontally, you, know, you might say future of work across, say, low, mid-level employees within the enterprise, but also vertically. So you might say, we're going to go build an autonomous AI for freight forwarders or you know, pick a vertical. Um, and I think that's really interesting, it's something I'm watching pretty closely. Oh, yeah, I was also going to add, like, um, uh, yeah, I think something that's been interesting across what I've seen is sort of just general workflow automation. Um, I guess specifically for our fund, we speak with, we meet with a lot of healthcare and biotech companies, and um, in the healthcare sector, this is really applicable. Um, we see a lot of folks coming from the industry and trying to tackle the issue of just general burnout across healthcare practitioners, whether doctors or nurses and whatnot. And there's a lot of elements in their workflows that um, that essentially the power of LLM and uh, translation of sort of um, narration of, uh, you know, summarization of conversations and things like that and being able to do like automated coding and billing. Um, there's a lot of procedure there that take up a lot of time for nurses and doctors outside of their general um, patient visits that um, have a lot of room for optimizations in there. Uh, but that, that's just one vertical example, and that sort of ac applies across the board, um, across different other verticals that have the same sort of issue. And beyond that, um, other sort of general themes I'm interested in as well is also bringing the sort of power of developers um, closer to the end users of those consumers of the application. So, for example, I mean, this just, for example, more concretely, like if you're a business user, for example, the typical sort of workflow you go through, you might have, you might be a subject matter expertise in a specific domain within your industry, but in turn, in if you, in the process of being a part of a business and getting more efficiency out of your out of your work, you may want an application developed out of that. The typical process for that has been to work with IT or a data analyst or data scientist to sort of spin up some sort of process application that can help with your workflow. Um, we're seeing a lot of applications come out these days that are being AI powered um, and just essentially allows 
the business user to become the data analyst, to become the data expert, and to become the application builder itself. Um, I think that's sort of an exciting area of development as well. Yeah. I think since, since I'm the only one who hasn't gone yet, uh, we invest in four themes that tend to kind of interact. Um, next generation computing is a big one. That includes AI, but also includes things like quantum computing software. Uh, this advance, these advances in computing will allow us to solve, as other folks have said, really, really important critical problems uh, around materials, circularity, problems in the real world. Uh, then it can be delivered through whether it's software as a service or a robot or uh, a, a machine, metal in the ground that generates energy, uh, any one of those things. So, but it all starts from that, you know, ad advanced computing in whatever capacity. Um, and we've made a couple of quantum investments that, that we think are going to be able to accelerate uh, the time to market for, uh, for those types of solutions. Hello. So I've kind of like Jim, I've been involved in Silicon Valley for decades. Um, my, my focus area is around HADR, Humanitarian Assistance Disaster Relief. What can venture capitalists do to look ahead and say, what is HADR 2.0? How can we improve technologies and approaches to actually save lives around the world? Well, I'll just tell you an interesting story, but I think when, when I was at Google, they were um, trying to solve that problem. And that was uh, one of the impetus, uh, impetuses, impeti, for um, wing, drone delivery. Their original thought around drone delivery was it could be used for humanitarian relief, for disaster, for emergency, and those were the original use cases. Um, as they went through, they realized that um, those were very high risk in terms of, not just in terms of where they were going or what it's at, but okay, if you're somebody, to start out in an alpha or a prototype, if you're, someone's relying on you to bring a defibrillator, that's a life and death problem. So why don't we solve something that's a little bit less crucial, like delivering a burrito or something and see if that works. And it has also, you know, I think um, the, you have a higher volume where you're able to uh, experiment more and confirm that the technology works and, and learn from it. So all that to say is I think there are lots of applications, there's lots of technology that can be applied there. I would like to see it mature a bit faster and have that kind of goal in mind in parallel. So uh, it it's, doesn't seem to be an either or, it can be an and. I think um, two things I would say. One is I think we were investors in a company called Zipline previously that were doing delivery of uh, blood in uh, countries such as Rwanda uh, for far-flung areas where you basically didn't have enough infrastructure to store kind of like those things at, uh, in remote villages as such. Um, so I think that was kind of like, you know, was very powerful in that capacity of what they did. I think what's happening right now, like there are a lot of technologies that are being developed to prevent these type of human disasters, like for example, um, AI for better weather forecasting that can help you understand if there is gonna be an extreme weather event and what can you do so that there is enough time for you to get the people out of the danger zone themselves. There are, there are some companies that are getting started that are going towards more better solutions for, for uh, fire departments to kind of like, you know, make it more easy for them to fight fire. So things like that are going on. Um, some of them are just a little bit difficult for VCs to fund because of the nature of how quickly VCs are looking for returns within like 10 to 15 year frame time. And some of them have much bigger horizons. So that's why you have to go and find patient capital from family offices or other sorts of alternative investment vehicles. We've seen some interesting applications for AI around um, 911 response, for example. I know in a lot of cities, I'm from Toronto. Toronto last month had a six minute 911 response time. Imagine being in a fire and waiting six minutes on hold. That's ridiculous. So that's something where AI 
a voice AI can collect that basic information and dispatch faster. So we're starting to see some technology in the emergency response space. Um, I'd also kind of break it down into preventative and reactive. And so we're seeing, I'm seeing solutions both in kind of uh, devices that can be help, uh, be leveraged to, to make a, a response better, more efficient, or water pollutant uh, kind of devices, uh, but also preventative, like, uh, like she's mentioned. Well, let's give it up for our panel. Let's give it up for the College of San Mateo, Cortify, SVB, and all our event partners and sponsors. Let's hear it for our event team and our video team. Let's hear it for Joe, our bouncer. Let's hear it for our audience. Let's hear it for me. <laughs> Stick around, network, socialize, and connect. There is an after party, and no, it's not at the Rosewood. It's not at Pizza My Heart, and no, it's not at the patio. It's going to be in the foyer. The delicious buffet continues, and we have some awesome desserts, vanilla cheesecake, chocolate mousse, and ice cream. So thanks for coming. I'll see you at the after party. <laughs>